This is Mind Pump. Right, today's episode, we have Dr. John Deloney on the show. He's the host of the very popular podcast, The Dr. John Deloney Show. He's incredible. This guy is a wealth of knowledge. In today's episode, we talk about marriage, relationships, husbands and wives, how you can make your relationship better. My wife's body isn't what it used to be, and I want to talk to somebody about it. I have absolutely no interest in having sex with my husband. What's going on? I don't want to leave my husband, but I don't want to break things off with this other gentleman either. I would break up right now. You're going to want to listen to this episode. By, by the way, you can find him, his show, and more at johndeloney.com forward slash mind pump. So it's John, D E L O N Y dot com forward slash mind pump. One more thing trainers and coaches, if you want to become more successful, you want to build a big business, you want to get your clients better results, go to mindpumptrainercourse.com. There we have some free information for you. We'll teach you how to close deals. We'll teach you how to project your sales and more. It's at mindpumptrainercourse.com. Today's program giveaway is MAPS Anabolic. In order to enter to win, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, this month's sale is ending in two days. You have 48 hours to take advantage of MAPS Anywhere at 50% off and maps hit also at 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. John, welcome back to the show, my friend. Dude, it's good to see you guys. One of oh, our favorite uh, people. Yeah. Always, always love having always you on, man. You. I, I wanted to, we wanted to talk to you today about marriage and stuff like that. Before we go, though, I want to ask you just a question because I've, I've seen some of your clips on YouTube and some of the questions that you answer, some of the callers that call in, I'm like, I can't believe these people are calling in. I can't believe you're helping them. They're insane. Can you recall some of the most challenging ones that have come in? I heard one the other day that just made me like, what was oh. it? It was, it was bad, man. It was, uh, it was a dude that called in that said he thought his friend was a potentially a pedophile. Oh yeah. Holy yeah. Bro, that's cow. Gonna, like, throw you off your rock. Yeah, right dude. This like super heavy how topic. do you handle some of the stuff that you're getting on, the, on these calls? I mean, I guess the, the, disturbing part is that often they're not, that's not the first time I've heard that or oh, I've been asked that question. That's crazy. Um, working with college students for so long, for so many years, they'd come sit down and be like, Hey man, I just stumbled on this in my roommate's computer oh, and I love uh, this guy and I don't know what to do. Right. And a, a, an 18 year old isn't understanding, Oh, that's a federal crime. Mm -hmm. And there's a kid, like they don't have that con concept. They just don't want to like they still want to be a bro. Right? right. And so it always comes from a good place. And as a teacher, you're teaching them, no, this is how you handle that hard stuff. It just pops up. Wow. So on the show too. What, what about when you have to tell people like, yeah, you probably should leave your husband or your wife. Like that's gotta be so. Yeah. I, so, so, um, you should go get divorced. Um, you should file for bankruptcy. A couple of these things that I know is going to ripple through your life for the rest of your life. Yeah. I, I won't do that. Okay. And often I'll tell people, I'm not going to let you, when this gets hard and ugly and you're sobbing in the middle of the night, you're splitting your time up with your kid. You're doing all that. I'm not going to let you blame me. Mm -hmm. You have to make that decision. So how do you balance that? That's if, right. If you're, if you're hearing like, and you're going in your head going like, they probably need to leave this person, but I know better than to give that advice. If it's violence or if someone's unsafe, I'll say, get out now. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if it's that like, no question. About but that. if there is even a chance that this person could save their marriage, yeah. even though you're probably going, there's a 98% chance they're not going to. I think to. people bail way too quick. Way, way do too Do you really? Quick. I do. Yeah. yeah. I do. Wait, wait, so, so why do you think that is? Um, I think it's what you're we talking about before we we're just hanging out. I, I think um, we've been raised on this idea that what we feel is the most important metric in our life. And um, even going back to the 80s, there was some wisdom about marriage. Don't fight in front of the kids. You're going to freak your kids out. You're going to scare them. And that actually makes sense. I get that. But it was wrong because what it did was they said, go fight in your bedroom and then come out and, pro and and provide your kids with a united front. What we did accidentally was we robbed kids of seeing two people who love each other, really disagree. Yeah. And then still have How dinner to work together. It out. Yeah. And then they, they're hugging two weeks later. Right. And so kids got to see, oh, mom and dad fight and they love each other. That's a, that's a normal part of any relationship. Y'all fight. We all, I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. and so now your first fight, you're like, oh, I guess this is over. I'm out. Right. Mm. Or when marriage gets hard, it gets boring. Right. We don't talk about that. Marriage gets boring. Mm. It's boring sometimes, man. And we're like, oh, it needs to be more this or this or this. 
And if I feel bored, if I feel tired, then you hear that phrase, it just ran its course. Oh, and I just think that's bull crap, dude. So it, it, y'all quit. It's fine. It's fine. You quit, but it doesn't just stop. Right. So it, is it, if I'm hearing this correctly, it's like, it's, it's the expectations that we go into the marriage is where we're, where we're, we're almost. That's going. probably a good way to put it. Yeah. Like I, you, I think we're too sensitive in the, you know, like one of the critiques of the current stock market is that instead of looking for trends, everyone is chasing this thing up and down every single day and no one's looking at the macro picture. Mm. I think marriage is the same. Mm. Like, we expect every sexual encounter to be like the Super Bowl, right? And they're not, right? You have like, a, right? Or, or a funny or like just regular boring married sex. And then it's too easy to be like, oh man, the spark's gone. No, it's not. It's a Tuesday, dude. And yeah. you just, someone cleaned up, throw up and you got to get up early tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. It's Tuesday. Y'all just connect and having a good time. Yeah. So I think we, we follow these little micro trends so much. And then we just, we call it. And we all had that friend again. I'm just thinking this off the top of my head, guys. We all had that, that girlfriend in high school. And I wonder what happened to so-and-so. Mm. Mm. Grass is green. Now I can find out. Sure. Yeah. Now I can contact her. Hey, what's up? Right. You should, you have to go find a phone book, which for the youngsters out there, where's the, where's the central camera? Yeah. <laughs> they used to print the internet out and put it on your front porch. <laughs> right. And you would just have to thumb through it and then call their dad, right. Yeah, Whatever. Yeah. And get her not, like and not yellow pages. <laughs> no, you aren't doing all that. Not if you're married, you got three kids, you're just, you're just driving. You're like, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. Well, now I can DM her and see how it's going. And so I think the avenues for alternatives is so great. Mm. It's just tough, man. Is it true that women file for divorce at a much higher rate than the, than men do like it's the it, it's the wives as um as the economic differences balance out culturally yes what do you mean by and that and so in 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 i'll say countries that's an easier way in countries where there is um women have greater economic opportunities okay as soon as they're able to provide for themselves they're not putting up with an abusive guy a bulldog, like an idiot. They're, they they can leave. Okay. In places where they can't, they're, they're stuck. They're trapped. Okay. And so, yeah, in in what we would call um, more egalitarian yeah. uh, cultures, absolutely, they leave. So, and and the reason is because they can. They can. Okay. Because they can. Okay. Yeah. So, and so the the conversation that I'm hearing among researchers is the world shifted, and two lies have been told. One lie t is to women is that. You're all you need. You don't need anybody else in your life. You can do all this by yourself. And so we're all, y'all experience this in your, in your line of work. Women are, are being buried by this lie that you can have it all, do it all, all by yourself. Yeah, yeah. Right. On the other side, men are, are being told if we could just get back to, right. right. And so there's no like, Hey, there's, you need some, you need to learn some new skills, man. And we don't have that. And right. so there's just this, this, uh, melting how do you how do you also balance that conversation of like we as as a society especially in the united states we've we have evolved and kind of changed and shifted to where you know a lot of times you know some women are, are making as much or more than their mm -hmm. partner some roles in the household are shifting like so we're moving away from kind of these old traditional values um how do you have that conversation when you get phone calls or people that are and you can kind of see that this is what we here's the hurdle like how do you talk to somebody uh, without offending them that maybe these things that they're driving towards is what's destroying their marriage because of the way society is, is, is speaking to men and women? Like, yeah, I, I, I get where I'm going I, with I, that. Yeah, I tried to uh, make it not so sensational. Like I look at it as less, I can't handle the, the macro value trends. That's, that's beyond my pay grade. What I can tell somebody is, Hey man, um, you're right. Your dad and your granddad, they worked all day. And your grandma and your great grandma stayed at home. Your mom stayed at home and took care of domestic stuff. Well, now your wife's an attorney and she makes six figures and you don't. So you can sit at home and complain about she's not working out or y'all can reevaluate what needs to happen in your home. And so I look at it more as a tools issue, as a skills issue, not as a big moral crisis. Do you think though that we're wired biologically to gravitate to one more than the other. And that sometimes that is an inner struggle that's happening where it's like, 
I'm that guy. I'm not making as much. My wife is making well, so much. But there's data that shows that men, uh, so women generally want to date someone that earns as much or more. Or more. And men typically- And date, educated as much or more. Yeah. And men typically want to date someone who earns as, as much or less. I just read that this morning, Richard okay. Reeves' book of Boys and Men. It's a masterpiece if you yeah. haven't read it. Yeah. So like um, women who start to climb the, the ladder of pay, start their, their, their dating pool shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. That's right. Because of that. So that's that seems to be biological. It, well- <sighs> Possibly. Maybe. I mean, Maybe. I mean, possibly. Um, I'm more concerned when it comes to men is, I don't know if it's biological, if it's theological, who, who knows what it is. Men need, and this, this isn't a religious statement. This is just the psychology data. Men need work. Men need a family and men need some sort of higher purpose, religion, some sort of faith practice that grounds them. And if we look over the last 25 to 50 years, we've just melted off. We've just pulled all three of those strings. And so men are completely untethered. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I was just drawing a map out and the airplane over, man, if you take away faith, then, then what's the larger thing I'm a part of? Oh, politics. That's what it is now. Mm -hmm. And if you pull, if you take away um, family, what's, what am I a part of now? I think it was three to one men die of opioid, mm. right? And opiates are the chemical that pretends to be the love chemical yeah, in the human body, it. right? And then the purpose, they're not, like, we don't talk about technology. It's just taking jobs, man. Just taking jobs, taking jobs, taking jobs. And so you got guys who are, aren't working. What are they going to do? They're, they're going to go hate. They're going to fight because that's where they've got a purpose, right? Mm. And that's why you look at the political parties. Nobody's offering a vision other than, the I'll burn sucks. his down. Yeah. 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 This guy sucks. And it's like, our plan is that guy sucks. Right. That's, and so that's become the circle. And so I can't think of a more important thing to do than to figure out, okay. Um, the rules of marriage have changed. Let's figure that out. Cause it's still important. It's still important. And if I'm talking to a young man, how do you become, if that's the case, then how do we educate you? How do we teach you how to go some job skills where you can go work? How do you learn a work ethic, right? How do you go learn these things instead of just opting out of the game completely? This is, I think- uh, I gotta make I mean, you dateable, right? And there's some- ma Marriable. There's some wisdom there because, um, you know, discipline is so important for young. I think it's important for everybody. It's, it's so important for young men because we don't have- we don't have a biological clock that naturally kind of tells us, hey, you better get your shit together. <laughs> we don't- you know, we can disconnect from, you know, partners easier, I guess, biologically than women can. Um, we can, we can be very single minded. So without that discipline and that focus, you're just a boy. You're yeah. just a kid forever yeah. Yeah. playing video games and buying fast cars and just hooking up with wherever. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. You know what you're saying? Well, and the, the, that's the ironic thing is the data says married men have way more sex than unmarried, yeah, right? <laughs> and yet there's this like super flex, like, bro, I, yeah. Like maybe. <laughs> yeah. Probably not. <laughs> probably probably not. not. Unless you're Dan Bilzerian, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Even though probably. him, did you see he came out and said he's all for monogamy? Really? He's like, that did not yeah, make yeah. me happy. Did you hear that? No. Huh? Yeah. He, I mean, he, he had an interview recently and they talked to, he talked about like, he actually broke down some stats, like admitting that, you know, many times he'd slept with seven to nine women in a day uh -huh. and like, cons like just hundreds and hundreds of women a year and so that. And that, you know, what he has found that like, who is this? Doug? Dan no, Bilzerian. Dan, Dan Bilzerian. <laughs> <laughs> who is Doug this? Bilzerian. You know who Dan, you know who Dan oh, yeah. Bilzerian is, don't you? I don't know who that dude Oh, oh he's like this he's social like the, media. He's like, like today. Uh, he's got yeah. like, I don't know, 10, 20 million followers. And he's like, he's a poker player guy, beer jacked. And he's yes. always got a boat Money full of yeah, 12 yeah. naked Boats chicks. And, and it's like every teenage, <laughs> every teenage boy you've ever talked to follows that He's guy. like an American uh, Andrew Tate? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Right. Shoots right. guns. Sure. Or, yeah, 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 just blows Snap up. to a Slim Jim. All right. All right. I mean, right. you can't help but watch his stuff. But he circled and, back and he's like. Yeah. I mean, he's been he's been projecting this kind of you know playboy image for the last I don't know how many years now for as long as we've been around yeah. I feel like it's been that long you, and has recently came out and said that yeah, yeah. do you, do you think we've oversold uh, or undersold monogamy and oversold this like it's terrible and you want to be with as many people as possible and that's the best way to be type yeah. of deal I mean I th yeah I, Did, and, and in fact I was talking to somebody recently um, and I just the data on we used to be like run around and have multiple part. I don't think that's accurate. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anthropological data is accurate. Oh, Maybe in certain cultures, in certain places, fine. But I don't think broadly speaking, that was accurate. And so, um, yeah, it, I, I think we, 
here's the analogy I like to use. We just went in, like downtown Nashville has rolled over the last 10 years. Like they take these old houses, just knock them down and build two tall and skinnies right in the, I'm sure y'all's place is the same. And I watched them walk in and just burn down grandma's house just because it was old, mm. just because old. And they put these two new houses in, they throw them up. The foundations crack in two years because they don't let them cure. They throw them up and they sell the square footage. They flip the house and they're gone. And it's like, no, there was, that house was built right. That house would have been here for another hundred years. It would have been here for another 200 years. And so I think the idea that we're just trying to hack everything and like, what's the, sometimes slowing down and doing things like, like the way our grandparents did it, our great grandparents did it, or people have been doing it for 2000 years. They may have been onto something, mm -hmm. right? Because that kept society tethered together. That kept families together. More importantly, that Reeves talks about is these kids, man, these kids. I think we've undersold the impact divorce has on kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's so ubiquitous. We Everyone's getting divorced. It's so common mm -hmm. that it's a trauma for children, yeah, right? Bro. And we can say, no, nah, it is. It is. It's tough. Even the best divorce. Yeah. Even the best divorce. Yeah. A kid's wondering, what did I do? Yeah. What happened? Do yeah. you think the two, like, um, in terms of the breakdown of how we view marriage mm -hmm. In the beginning, it's, it's it's this big overcorrection now from maybe, you know, back in the day, it was so pushed to get married so early, so young, like uh, immediately that was like your, your option. And then a lot of people felt trapped in that situation. They didn't really spend their time waiting for the right person and to, um, you know, take, take it as seriously as they should have in terms of it being a lifetime commitment. And this being, there's no way out of this. Uh, yeah, I, I think no fault divorce accelerated a lot of that. You just, you, you had like two important things in that question that are actually separate. Um, <coughs> my grandmother and my granddad, I think they were married for 73 years before my granddad died. And I remember my grandmother, she's a riot dude. And she was like, he couldn't have waited another 18 months to get 75. I mean, she's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. She died shortly after, right? And I remember a look she had in her eyes when she said this, these words, I don't know what to do. And I remember thinking, oh, you lost like a leg and a mm -hmm. lung, right? When I think of 73 years, they were soulmates. When they were right before the World War II and they got married, dude, my granddad, before he got shipped off, they got married. They had four kids. They raised them through World War II, Vietnam, all the ups and downs, all the... Then they were so they became soulmates, and now we try to reverse engineer that with let's be soulmates first, mm. and then try to do seventy three years. Mm. And so we try to do soulmates by how does it feel, mm -hmm. and you can't. You have to do it based on what you said. Till we got, I'm gonna to die yeah. with you, no, you and that means we got to figure it out. You right. can't do anything hard just based off feel. Imagine trying to raise no. your kids based off of feel. Imagine trying to get in shape. Yeah. Imagine trying to like. As soon as I went to therapy and sat with a trauma therapist and it got hard, and I'm like, ah, I'm good, man. Like, yeah. I'm out because it hurts. Man, nothing good, nothing good is done with, is, is not done without pain, mm -hmm. without some sort of discomfort. This is the worst. And in marriage, it can be a year. It can be two years. It can be a long time, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> now, what do you think about the data that says that, like, uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, that women are more likely to, just because of the way they're wired, they're more likely to pick up on, uh oh, this isn't going right. Let, let's talk this out. This may be an issue. We need to kind of sift through this. Let's figure this out. And men are far more likely to avoid, avoid. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. And then that causing the issues later on where, because you hear the stories where the guy's like, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden she's just like, I can't be with you anymore. And she's like, I've been telling you for 10 years. <laughs> right. I do think marriages have a, a, that marriage relationship, I think all relationships, work relationships, friend relationships, but marriage relationships, um, they, yeah, we, we're not very clear with each other, right? I do think I could see an evolutionary psychology. I can, I can see why a woman would have to be more attuned to social cues because- <clears throat> Well, they care just, for a baby, an infant. It's gotta yeah. be it's, it's unsafe, right? Um, and I can also, the, like the stereotypical Neanderthal, just like, I'm gonna go to work, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, that goes back to the new rules. Like it, you can't be a guy, I just go to work and do it. You have to learn a new set of skills, which is I've got to learn how to connect with this person who is a co-earner, who's a co-worker in this home, who has co-standing. It used to just, my mom, I, we may have talked about this before. My mom, this is not long, dude. My mom was not, when she got married to my dad in 1970, was not allowed to get a checking account yeah. or sign a mortgage. This isn't a long time ago. No. 
And so my mom married a homicide detective in, in the state, in Houston, a Texas homicide detective whose wife's not allowed to get her own checking account. And now, 50-something years later, right? My mom's got a PhD and she's a professor and she can do whatever. She, she, can, she can leave my dad today for no reason, mm -hmm. go buy a house, right? And she can do whatever she wants. <clears throat> and to, to travel that arc, man, that's pretty impressive, right? But it's just different. And so we have to learn new rules. I got to learn how to speak a different language. I got to learn how to communicate. I got to learn how to do things that are natural to me. That's a part of being in a relationship, yeah. man. One of the biggest changes I think I'm seeing is how um, men view fatherhood. I know when I was yeah. a kid and yeah. maybe before that, a dad was kind of play with you and be authoritative. And that mm -hmm. was it. Like if you were lucky, you got a dad that played with you on the weekend mm -hmm. and gave you some structure. You're seeing a lot more dads be much more involved in child rearing and caring about how their kids. Is this, are you seeing a lot of this? I would now? imagine that's part of what well, he's saying of the co-parenting yeah. and not having to learn that skill. because the <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but the data says that's <laughs> generally reserved for, and this is general. There's going to be a lot of guys in the comments who are like, no, I, and I honor that. But that's usually higher income households hmm. is a bachelor degree or higher co-earner ish right? Husband and wife are making about the same. And then Why? now I've, cause I've got time and I got resources. Uh, I'm not working seven days a week in the shop, putting on front ends. Right. Mm -hmm. And I get home and I'm just kaput. There are men who are amazing men who get off that shift and they do go to little league and they do go like, that's a, that's awesome. Right. Um, they're just more rare. I totally yeah. subscribe to that. I mean, that was a, my motivation of waiting so long is cause I can't imagine trying to be a dad in my 25, because I know what I was doing work-wise. I was working six days a week, right. 10, 12 hour days. I strung 170 days with no days off before. Like mm -hmm. how, I, there's no way I would be the same dad I am today. That's right. So yeah. uh, that makes a lot of sense. I have, I have uh, four kids, but two is a big age gap between the two of them. And my first two, I worked like that. Mm -hmm. The second two, it's very different. And the relationship I have with my little ones is, it almost makes me feel guilty. Oftentimes it does. Sure. Yeah. Because you don't know your kids just by playing with them sometimes. You actually know them through like changing their diapers, feeding mm -hmm. them, waking up in the middle of the night with them, that kind of stuff. And I didn't know that. I had no idea. I didn't know what I was missing. Well, and, and I think and it goes back to, we we're just talking about, you know, sex has to be the Super Bowl every night or there's yeah. something wrong with our relationship. Similar, I think we sit down and dads, especially, we can be pretty bad about like every moment has to be like this, this teaching, this event, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like everything has to be a lesson. Uh -huh. My wife, uh, she's real wise. She, I was doing something. My daughter came in and my son was doing something. And she goes, what if you just tried being likable? <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And she goes, hey, every time like me? our son walks in the room, he's an sense. amazing kid. I'm like, hey, pull your shorts down. Why you got your shoes like that? Tuck your shirt in. And she goes, you would not want to be with any dude who talked to you like that. Yeah. My daughter comes in. I'm like, why are you wearing that? Forget your backpack. Don't forget your... And so literally I was like, to roll my eyes. and like, Ugh. I just stopped. And it's amazing. And what I'm finding is it's the little things. It's the right before school. It's the, uh, we go, my son and I eat at Waffle House every Tuesday morning. It's not great for my body. Trust me, <laughs> it's not good. But we go, it's the only little t t a little yeah. diner in my little town. I live in the rural outside of Nashville. We go every Tuesday and it's boring. Don't talk about anything. Don't talk about anything. Don't talk about anything. And then, hey, dad. Right. And mm -hmm. so it's just showing up and it's just showing up. And marriage is like that. It's you, just boring. It's date night, boring date night, boring date night, boring date night. You can try something. Right. It, that's yeah. how it happens. Yeah. You know, that, that advice reminds me of advice that I learned in business uh, from a book called One Minute Manager. And I feel like this applies in relationships and raising kids is you think as a dad, you, you, all, you set all the boundaries and the rules and you punish when they're wrong, this and that. And in the book, it's like the same thing, right? It's talking about like leadership. So you get into management, your job is to correct your employee when they do something wrong. And this book flipped that whole theory on its head. And it said, no, instead, every time you see your employee, look for something to compliment them on or tell them what they're doing a good job. And then that opens the door for those people. And I remember when I applied that to my staff, how blown away I was because all I, I said, okay, I'm going to stop telling them what they're doing wrong. I'm going to hundred percent focus on all the things they do right. What mm. I love about them. And then all of a sudden they started coming to me with their problems mm. and what they were doing wrong. They come and just admit like, Adam, I fucked up yesterday yeah, on yeah. this and that. And then it opened the door for me to correct coach 
and and teach. Yeah. And it's like I feel like that same kind of philosophy applies in your household with your partnership and your kids. It's like instead of looking for all the things they're always doing wrong, it's like as a father, how can I look at all the things my son is doing well and point it out and celebrate it and make him mm -hmm. feel that way? Then he feels comfortable when he's challenged or he fucks up to come to me. It, it's same with same with your same with your wife. Right. Right. Same with your husband. Like same what if I spent all the time looking for what they're doing awesome instead of looking for all the like, yeah. hey man, what about this? What about, it, it, it's a, it's, it's a powerful. Yeah. It's super it, powerful. And, and you have to be consistent with it though. It's not like one of those things that you could say like, oh, I'll try and compliment them and then you expect something in return. Mm -hmm. It's like, I remember I set a goal of like, okay, I'm going to commit to this for like three months of just consistency. I'm not going to break. I'm not going to correct or discipline. I'm just going to be positive, 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 everything. And it, it, it blew my mind and it forever set and changed the way I managed and led a staff. And it was like, what a powerful, powerful thing I learned with that. And I feel it applies in relationships. Well, and it's not, it's not anti uh, accountability <clears throat> either, right? right? It actually gives me credibility when I do have to hold my 14 year old accountable. I've built such a powerful relational foundation with him that when I say you can't do that in this house, right? That's not who the Delonies are. He knows I'm not just lobbing another, here comes another grenade from dad, right? right? right. It is. Now this one's for real. Yeah. And I told him, every time you walk out, you got your shirt on backwards. Every day I'm telling you, put your shirt on. Like middle school's different, man. Middle yeah. school now they're just like, that's just that's just Sal being Sal. Yeah. When I was a kid, it was brutal, man. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I told him, I said, I'm turning you over to the middle school wolves, man. Like, I'm not gonna say another <laughs> thing about your shirt or your pants being on like uh -huh. rock and roll, brother. You're yeah. my son, and I'm gonna let them have you. <laughs> and of course they don't anymore. They're like, oh, that's just that's unique him, right? Whatever the thing is. <laughs> but like what it was an ego thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'm not, I'm not going to lose my relationship with my son over something stupid like that. I went through the same thing with my son's haircut. It just yeah. bothered me. Cause it's like, dude, you have a mullet. Like, <laughs> why is nobody hazing you about this? You know, it's like fully accepted. And, yeah. And it, yeah. But that's, again, it's, it's just me trying to infuse what I want. Uh, in his direction and it's like look he's got to live his own life figure it all out himself you know have his own peer group that's that sort of checks deal. each other yeah it's not a big deal that's, at all. It's, yeah. it's just not yeah it's not that big of a deal yeah. Yeah. focusing on the wrong things what about yeah. the communication challenges you always hear um, you know we just don't communicate or they need to communicate better right because women and men and women tend to have their own styles of communication what are what are some things that men and women can learn about communicating with the opposite sex so they can kind of be understood I think the there's a, a psychiatrist named William Glasser. He passed away in the nineties and he, uh, some of his stuff hasn't aged well, but a couple of us, a lot of his stuff has aged amazing. And he said this one for, he, he used to laugh at the idea of marriage therapy. He said, I can fix any couple in two sessions. Right. And you're like, okay, yeah, right, right. Whatever. Yeah. And he said, we think in pictures and we speak in words. And he said, when you align the pictures, everything's fine. Hmm. And I was like, that's lame. And so, uh, like, here was here was the sentiment. Um, and stop me if we've had this conversation before. Uh, okay. But he said, or this is my analogy. My wife comes to me on, like, a Monday, and she's like, this Friday, you and me, hottest date ever. Get ready. And she just walks away. Kind of flirty walks away. And dude, I'm like, yes, right? That's what's up. <laughs> and by the end of that day, I'm like, man, I wonder what I'm going to be wearing for how long. And yeah. then by Tuesday, I'm like, how are we going to get a helicopter to land here? To like, <laughs> yeah. or what hotel are we going to end up at? Who's going to take the kids? Who cares? It'll be fine, right? Yeah. And then Friday rolls around. I get off of work. I shower again. I put on something real nice. And I come out of the bedroom. And she's sitting there in running shorts and a T-shirt. And she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what are you doing? And it's like, you said this is a hot date. And she's like, yeah, dude, Taco Barn has burritos two for a dollar. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to go get off the rails tonight. We're going to eat. And she's like, I'm going to have gas too. So like, <laughs> gonna, right. <laughs> and so when she said the word date, I had a picture and she had a picture. I love burrito night, man. I love getting off the rails with good Mexican food. And she likes good, like romantic rendezvous getting away for a weekend. But we just talk past each other. And so now I'm mad. She's mad that I'm mad, right? And that happens with something as simple as, hey, tonight, when you get home, I'm going to need a break. <clears throat> All right. My picture for that is, and this is going to make me sound like a sexist idiot, and I don't mean to be, but um, all right, cool. After the kids are in bed, after, you know, after we've all cleaned up dinner, after you've made the meal, like after we're all ready to rock and roll for the night, I won't bother you. 
<laughs> yeah. And for her, I need I needed some time tonight. Is the moment you walk in that door, I'm walking out that door, and I yeah. may not come back. Right, yeah, I'm yeah. going to be gone for a minute. And so it's simply saying uh, the sentence that changed my marriage when my wife and I sat across the table several years ago, and like no drama, and I'm drama, big drama, no drama, no whining, no complaint. Like, are we going to stay married? Because this is run- this can't happen. This is done. We can't keep being married like we have been. Are we going to keep doing this? Because if we are, it has to all be different now. And both of us agreed, I'm all in, I'm all in. And it started with the the the, the way back was, what does your picture of today look like? Mm. That was it. What's your picture of tonight look like? Hey, I'm going, we're going to your uh, mom's house tonight. What's your picture of that? Because mine is, I'm going to get there and I'm going to go out back and I'm going to disappear. And hers is like, no, 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 you're going to sit here and we're going to talk and we're going to have family time. Okay, now that I got your picture, I can do that all day mm-hmm. long. It's when I'm out there and she's resenting that I'm not in here. And then I get in and she, I can feel her yeah. mad and I resent mm-hmm. that she's mad. What's your picture of tonight look like? That question was one of just a couple of questions that brought us all the way back. I think that is such mm-hmm. a, a powerful thing to say. <clears throat> it resonates so much with me because when I, I think back to the last like kind of big fight that Katrina and I had, it was, a, it was Christmas. Mm-hmm. And... I had a, an expectation. This is my son's fourth Christmas on how I wanted to look. And uh, and I didn't communicate that. Mm. You know, I just, I expected her. <sighs> to read your mind. To read my yeah, mind in a yeah. sense, right? Or, or to think the same way. Like, this is your son's fourth Christmas. Wouldn't you want to do right. these things? Oh, and you don't? So you don't yeah. even love him? Do you even love me? Like, right. why? Are, didn't even, now it doesn't feel good. Like, totally. Oh, you chose your family over That's, me and right. us. And, oh, yeah, it was all of that. It was well, all, and, and, most guys would take it one step further and say, I just want this fourth Christmas to be awesome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, like when I tell my, when I, I remember one time I told my son, he was like seven and I, and he was talking and I had some guys over and I was trying to be cool and he was talking and I, and I looked at him and said, Hey, will you just be cool? And then I turned and I remember I just started laughing and I was like, like a seven year old knows what, will you just be cool means to <laughs> like yeah, a 40 yeah, year old. Right. Yeah, he didn't yeah. know what that means. And so I can then turn and say, Hey, can you just like, when we're talking, Kids don't talk when the adults are talking. Wait your turn, and then just and you can pop in, right? You, it's, it's just explain it. Now, right? a lot, a lot of the some people listening, some people might be like, okay, that sounds great, but you know, when we talk to each other, my husband, he's had trauma as a mm-hmm. kid, and he gets triggered when I say certain things, or my wife, she's got certain issues, and you know, pe- people say, hey, I need to cool off, let me leave for mm-hmm. a second, but that triggers her abandonment issues or whatever. How do you see through that so you can kind of read the subtitles where you can kind of see, okay, I see what's going on. I understand what the situation is and let me, let me be here for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to speak real directly to that. Yeah. Is that cool. Um, I got some black holes in my past, ugly stuff. And I looked at my wife and I said, I will stand by you until death do us part. And when I did that in front of God, in front of our family, in front of our friends, in front of her, that meant I have to know, I have to do the work to know when I'm getting triggered on something. And it's my responsibility, not hers. It's my responsibility to take active control of getting set off, of speaking up and saying, I need five minutes. I'll be right back. Or whenever somebody says, I need a break. The important part of a break, which are super important. I still take breaks now. My wife still takes breaks now, right? Um, is I'll be back in 30 minutes. Or the other night I was getting heated on something. We were talking way past each other. And I said, I have to be done with this conversation tonight. We will start it again tomorrow morning, right? And so I capped it. I put a boundary on it. That way she's like, he just runs away from me. But dude, that's my job. If you have trauma in your, in your history, it is not your partner's job to fix that and solve that because they can't. And it's a, it's a, it's an act of avoidance, man, to be like, well, she just keeps triggering me. She says, it. I, I I actually think a lot of that is solved still by the, what you just said before that though. Like if you do a good job of heading into a situation, because going back to the story I was sharing with the issue that Katrina and I had, a lot of that has to do with my own expectations, my own trauma, my own like way I was raised the family and the way she was, and we don't align. And when we look back at that, that big blow up, we actually both agree that there's I, the way we handled the fight. I wouldn't change a thing, and neither would she. She agrees. But what we would have changed was the conversation before. We both said that. Yeah. I wish we would have talked about this because I wish I knew that's what you expected, and I wish I knew that's what you wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And we could have either found somewhere in the middle, or like she said, she's like, I totally would have done that with you if I would have yeah. known. Yeah. So if you would like, so if you're going into a situation 
where you know your partner does, is gonna, you're different in it, right? Like family events. I know, Sal, you can relate to this because Jessica's like me with this, right? So you go into that event, like something I can practice and be better about is just having that conversation before we head over there. Hey, what is, what's your expectations today when we go to your family's house? Because this is how I think it's going to play out or I would like it to play out. Right. What do you think? And that would totally solve because even if it does happen because of our trauma on our shoes we'd already communicated our, our expectations so to get back to home base really quick or handle that i i find that it would just diffuse that we almost. have the same picture in our mind yes right and also what you're talking about is just throw your ego out the window yeah when you go to her parents house that's her it's her event Mm -hmm. You're, you are a window dressing. This one's not about you, dude. And so if you sit down, if Sal sits down at his big Italian dinner, uh, like with his family and everyone's, I'm just, I'm totally stereotyped. That's, you, that's your accurate. It's yeah. loud. <laughs> Marlon Brando he comes it, out. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, hey, it's, like you've been there. it's loud, uh, screaming, right, yeah, drinks whatever. flowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's olive oil. Yeah. <laughs> olive oil and pasta. <laughs> yeah. um, but I would suggest that your wife is, maybe by this point, she's, she's yeah. like a part of that, but, it's your event and she's there to, to be supportive of that event and vice versa. Right. And so if I go to my in-laws house with my wife and they have some of their own family traditions and history they've done forever, and I'm trying to make that about me. Like, I don't even like it. Shut up, go, go mm -hmm. and say, what's your picture of this for me? How can I be a part? Like, man, it'd be cool if you just sat in there and were quiet. Done. <laughs> done. Right? Yeah, It'd be cool if you that. took my dad and y'all went, done. Yeah. We, my dad's going to ask you to go to the hardware store. Will you just go? You know, right? you just know, go, man. What you said about triggers uh, is is accurate, but it's way harder than that, right? Because a trigger it's hard. stays with you, right? Yeah. It's a part, of, it's a reaction that you're unable to even process until it happens. Mm -hmm. How did your wife work with you through that because I'm, it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't like just snap done. Sure. Triggers are gone. I can, I can totally handle this. Well, she had her own, but I mean, but I mean it, it, it like what's the process look like to work through that? Cause it, it can't, it doesn't happen overnight. No, somebody has to have the courage. So it, it shifts from the conversation shifts from as you become more vulnerable with each other. And I, I still, I hate that word, but it's the only one I got. Yeah. And I think that vulnerability is an act of courage and bravery, not an act of cowardice. Grief. It's tough to look at somebody and say, this is all of me. Do you still love me? That's scary, man. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it starts with what's your picture of this. And then as you become braver and your relationship gets tighter, it becomes, here's what I need. Here's my picture of this. Here's what I'm picturing. And I'm going to put on the table because you can reject that. But I put it on the table and that's scary to do that. And so it takes somebody to say, I don't know what happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You cannot talk to me like that. I'm not going to be at this table when you act like X, if you walk away, every time we have a hard conversation, we're never going to solve this problem. I'm asking you to stay at the table with me this time. Um, and then if I can't, that's my job to go solve that. Cause I have to be able to sit at the table, mm -hmm. right? I have to be able to sit here. <clears throat> and so that's my job, but somebody at, has to have the courage to put what they want or what they need on the table. And that's tough. Most people, um, the, the joke on my show all the time is, like y'all made humans together, yeah. right? You were in the delivery room. That's a lot. What do you mean you won't tell? You can't. You don't know how to tell her you don't want to go to Christmas at her, mom, <laughs> at her mom's house. It's like, well, I don't know, man. Like, bro, y'all made a human. You're past that now. Have that conversation. And so I think it's just it's about courage. And you're gonna get rejected. It's gonna be awkward. And you're gonna feel yourself getting mad. And that's part of the work you got to do, man. Yeah. For people listening uh, who are going through challenging times with their marriage, uh, what percentage would you say of successful marriages? hit those points where they thought they were going to break. A hundred. So it's, it's so common. It's so common that it's, successful it's, marriages it's almost don't make yeah. it. So just, I don't know that, that helps. I don't know that they almost don't make it, but a hundred percent of the time there's a car wreck. Yeah. Always. Right? A hundred percent of the time, somebody at work, when you're at, when you're feeling low or you're in the routine or you got two kids and one's in diapers and one is just learning to walk and they're staring at you while you're trying to go to the bathroom, right? It's all like, yeah. it's exhausting uh -huh. and you're getting takeout every night and then you come to the office and she thinks your jokes are hilarious. Hmm. And then you text her another joke. Like that's, ev that happens, right? Or I just don't feel it anymore or I'm just scroll. I, that's life, right? I don't know any relationship doesn't run into something like that. I thought this was going to look different. I didn't want to be married to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The choice is, are we going to sit in this thing and decide, let's figure this out and let's solve this problem? Or 
Are we going to, are we going to quit? I'm going to walk away. Do you think people have a distorted view of divorce in the sense that it's easier than marriage? Like, Oh, divorce with kids. Yeah. It's easier than this marriage. Man, that's a great question. Um, I think that's a complicated answer because I think there are people in abusive situations that, well, that, that they is, find peace. That, yeah. They finally have peace. Um, I think people are uh, underrepresent the trauma. And I don't mean, I don't use that word, just throwing it around. I think right. it's hard, right? Because y'all had, y'all had a picture, y'all had plans, right? And those plans are over. I thought we were, yeah. I thought I could. And that's, you grieve all that, man. That's tough. Not to mention your, your close friend or your ride or die, or you got kids, like the, just the dance of it all is a mess. Um, and I think we don't talk about the economic impact generally for women after divorce, they're, they, their net worth goes down and often on two income homes, the guys goes up for a season, right? So it's tough, man. Um, but yeah, I think people think if I can just stop feeling bad here, then this, this is everything in my life can be great. And here's the path. I can just no fault this in 30 days. We have to sign the paper. We can just call it good. And I think it gets real hard after that. How yeah. What what percentage? I know it's impossible to put a number on this, but like, <coughs> how much of the the failure in in marriage do you think is actually people literally choosing the wrong person, like uh, being attracted to someone who you lust after and you have trauma aligned versus <laughs> right. like a good teammate or a partner, and you misconstrue that that roller coaster up and down, endorphins and stuff flying as like love when it's really not. It's your it's your attraction to your trauma that you're actually brought together and you're not even supposed to be together <sighs> or do you not subscribe to that? Well, I, I don't, I don't have any data on that out of the gate. I still will. I, I cause I, cause here's the, the opposite argument is that people marry for the quote unquote right reason. And it's just going to work. And that's not true either. Right. right. The only way my marriage works is I wake up every day and I decide I'm going to love that woman today. Sure. So there's exceptions and to the so, rules on both sides. Right. I could also see where the two people. I think people have to decide, man. Right. They have to decide. I mean, that's also powerful too, because that was something I learned. I, I mean, uh, I used to say as a kid that I didn't believe in love because of all my trauma and bullshit. Yeah. Right. But I mean, love is a choice. It's a choice. It's yeah. a choice. And yeah. I, I wish someone would have taught me that. Like I, I was taught it was you know the Disney thing. It was like a feeling yeah, like Titanic, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna walk into a room. Yeah, I dated my wife for five years. We broke up all the time. Um, and because I grew up when uh, it was Goodwill Hunting and Titanic came through the theaters around the same time, <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's what that is. Yeah. Like I'll just see her, I'll know, and yeah. we'll call it. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about loyalty. I didn't know yeah. anything about ride or die. I didn't know anything about my own insecurities. I just was like, no, that's what the music will swell and this is what will happen. I think love is a choice that comes with the rad blessing of some pretty amazing feelings along the way. But it's a mm. choice and it's a choice and it's a choice and it's a choice. Yeah, which, and it's just which, not Hollywood, man. It sucks. Which work and sacrifice is paired to that, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. It's same as getting in shape, man. Same as d yeah. growing a business. Same with doing anything that matters. Same with growing a garden, dude. It's yeah. anything that matters is a lot of boring, a lot of repetitive, a lot of discipline, a lot of it's kind of lame and some pretty amazing times. Well, so, it's, so what's interesting about a lot of this is that as, as, young, as a young man or young man, um, you you – when people say, oh, you're, oh, you're married. Oh, life's over. Oh, it's so much more fun being single. You'll have more sex. You'll have better sex. It's a good time. The data actually shows. It's not true. Yeah, yeah. Like married men have more sex. The most satisfying sex that people report are couples who've been together a long time. Yes. And it's not couples in their twenties. It's like couples in their sixties. In other words, they've been together for a long time. They don't have perfect bodies anymore. And yet they're having the most connected, uh, you know, sex that they've ever had. Right. But a lot of people aren't familiar with this because media portrays it as the opposite. So I feel like it's sold so terribly. Well, in, in what I'm what I'm wrestling with right now, <laughs> um, and I'm trying to work it out in my head, it'll take me a while. I think we told everybody that you are the most important thing in the world, <laughs> and you are. Like so when you get your individual life right, then you can go join forces with some other individual who's got their life right. Right. Good luck. And I don't think that's right. No. I think two imperfect knuckleheads get together and stumble through it and are at the beginning are dumb enough to keep going and then realize, oh, I'm I'm better with than without. And you just keep going and you grind it and you figure it out. It's 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 a conversation. 
maybe it was with you. It was either with you or Lane. It was like, I was just like, when I started this whole thing, I was still just the same size as I've been. And it was like, will you just shut up and just start lifting every day? Just be quiet and start lifting weights and shut up. <laughs> That's probably Lane. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, it's probably, yeah, yeah, that's probably, yeah. But it was like this, just stop talking. Yeah. Look at me and look at you just lift. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, like, like if we go back and look at the interview I did two or three years ago here, yeah. I look different. Yeah, yeah, right. My yeah, shirts yeah, don't fit anymore. Yeah, yeah. Some in the bad way, but some in the good way. Right. <laughs> but like, um, <clears throat> You just got to keep doing it. You just got to keep doing it. You just got to keep doing it and be really grateful for the, when those times are amazing and be really honest and intentional about when they're not. Do you think there's uh, like milestones or tipping points when, when partners figure that out that are like, like you know, I don't know, like if there's certain things. Yeah. Is there data that, on that? Like after 10 years after yeah, or, years. or certain events like this happened and then all of a sudden that it clicks that like, oh yeah, we could, the, the more work and sacrifice and we, we do for each other, the, <clears throat> the greater we're paid off. We Katrina and I have this like say, saying in our relationship that like anytime we do like our gratitude and stuff together, it's like, man, why is this so good? It's like, man, this is, this is God rewarding us for putting in the hard work. We've made these sacrifices. We do these things. We're consistent with it. And it's like, that's why it's so good. And that's, and we say that to each other. Is there things like that, that, or exercises that marriages can go through intentionally to achieve that feeling, I guess. You get where I'm going with that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the things coming out of me and my wife deciding we're going to stay together or not is um, it goes back to, well, I got it from, his name is Rick Lytle. He was the dean of the business college where I worked. And I had a, I had a, a staff and he's a great speaker and I needed someone to speak at one of our like staff meetings. So he came and he was talking about his family values that they had on the wall in their home and that they had worked through as a family. And then he said, he talked about his strategic plan they go through every year. And I was like, oh God, leave it to a businessman to ruin a family. Right? <laughs> and I, I asked a question, I'm, I'm, uh, my staff's supposed to be asked a question. They're not asking. And I'm like, all right, dude, why do you have a strategic plan for your Actually, family? That's cool. Well, here's what he said. <laughs> he goes, how many businesses spend five years of consultants, time, vision, casting, budgeting, spreadsheeting, planning. And there's the magic sentence he said for something that doesn't matter. Yeah. And then you just go home to the thing that is legacy, your family tree. And you do have no training, no planning. You just no do it like values. your dad did nope. it. Yeah. You have no yeah. centralized yeah. thing other than what our society tells us, which is how do you feel today, yeah. right? And that guides us. So you got two people untrained, not know what they're doing. You throw kids in the mix. You throw financial stress in the mix. You throw job loss in the mix, in the mix parent loss in the mix, and you're just doing this. So he said, we decided to ask ourselves, who are we going to be? And so my wife and I, just, again, I was scrambling to try to save my marriage. And so like, all right, we're going to start a strategic plan every year. And then we have an economics, a, what are some things you want to try this year? Like romantically, sexually, what do you want to try? Like uh, going out and try dancing this year. I'm going to try jujitsu. Like what are, what are the things we want to be about? What kind of parent are we going to be? And then the next year is how do we do? What was wrong? What was good? We look month by month and it has been extraordinary. And by the way, we we're talking about Dr. Becky Kennedy earlier, yeah. by having a set of family values, I don't say things like when my daughter or my son pops off, like all kids do. I don't say, hey, you don't talk to my wife that way, get out. Because then I teach my kids, there's a line to which you have fractured your relationship with me. Right. There's a line uh -huh. which, which if you cross it, I'm going to send you away from me. Now I say to my son, hey, the Delonies don't talk to each other that way. You just opted out. And now this house isn't going to work as well because you're not with us. Don't opt out, man. We need you here. But you opted out for 15 minutes or 25 minutes or 30 minutes. And he learns the responsibility that he played, right? So it's a total reframe. My wife can say, hey, dude, we got invited to this thing. One of our core family values in our house is you say yes, because we're both introverts. We're both nerds. And we could both just go to bed at eight o'clock and call it. And so I know it's not healthy for me. And so one of my rules is if you get invited, you got to say yes. And so all the guys getting there for fights, I'm, that's why I'm here in town. Like I'm yeah. going to a concert, man. Like, Hey, we should go. <laughs> and my first thought was, I just want to go to bed. And then like, ah, <laughs> I have to go. It's going to be a great time. But when I'm start to say, I don't want to go. My wife says, it's not who we are. And like, all right, we're going. How right? important is it for, uh, for men and women to have good 
friends outside of the marriage that it's are everything. also couples, you know, where they could have other families and couples too. Well, most spouses end up one of two things. They end up the play-by-play therapist, which is not their job, or they end up the trash can. Mm. Like you just come home and just vomit all the work stuff, all the crap. And, and like, I don't know how y'all work with your spouse. Y'all are crazy, man. Like that's ta- Like that's an extra layer of, right. of, of planning and all that. Um, but you have to have people outside of that um, that you are able to offload, to complain, to be frustrated about things, try to solve problems. My wife is way smarter than me. She doesn't need me to solve her problems. When she comes in and says, like, today was hard at work because of this, this, and this, when I start being like, well, you know, you should have just told that guy. Yeah. Man, she doesn't need that from me. She just needs me to sit with her. And when I say something to her, I need some help, man. But I can't say I need some help. So I'll say I'm really struggling with something. And she's learned, oh, you just handed me the ratchet. And you want me to try to take a turn and see if I can fix it. Mm. So um, I, I've got to have other people that I talk to. I've got my own counselor. I've got my own group of buddies. And she's got her. She's leaving this weekend to go to Florida, hang out with her old college roommates. Like they're still super tight. She has to have that. Mm. What, are, what are some, what does the data show on practices that, that successful families and marriages um, have? Like in other words, is is does having a spiritual practice play a big role uh date night you know like are, are there practices that we see in the data where it's like okay successful families they tend to do these things and the ones that aren't so successful tend to not well a lot i can speak more to the well i can speak more to the family outcome okay. like kids do better when there's people families have dinner together right it's like little small things like that okay when parents coordinate things together when both parents are involved right um, I don't know the data off the top of my head when it comes to particular family practices. Okay. It's been my experience sitting with people that every family is just <clears throat> super weird in their own weird way. Sure. Right. Some people just like to put on jorts like Justin's family and go, hi- <laughs> go hiking. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. Or you like do somersaults on a trampoline. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. And y'all may want to like work out together. And me and my wife like to s- sit by each other and read books. Right. Like, and we don't even talk. We're just right next to each other. And I like that. Um, and I'm embarrassed that I was just embarrassed to say that out loud. I don't think I've ever said that. <laughs> but like, I, if my wife's like, hey, let's just go sit and read, I'd be like, yeah, right? And yeah. that's embarrassing for me, but it is what it is. And so I think every family's unique in what brings them energy and peace and all that. But I think the magic is what would probably, the, the thread that would bind every family together, especially married couples is, do we talk about it? And do we honor each other's weird things? Is it is it necessary for your partner to have a lot of things in common with you? no. Mm-hmm. No, talk about that a little bit, because <coughs> a lot of people think that that's necessary. Like we have to have, have everything in common. We have to be yeah. identical, but it can create difficulties. It creates lots of di- it creates difficulties. I think if you don't have tools to talk about them, right, right, and and I'm pointing at me because it says me and our relationship. Um, going to Vegas to see Social D this weekend, right? My wife rather set herself on fire than, <laughs> go, than go to that trip, <laughs> right? And um. This makes me kind of lame. I don't like going and sitting on the beach for six hours. I'd rather go fishing. I'd rather go do something. And that's where she's going this weekend, right? Mm -hmm. And so it makes things complicated. Like we had to navigate childcare. We had to navigate different things and all. Um, And then sometimes on a vacation, we lean more towards what she wants to do. And sometimes we lean more towards what I want to do. That's about taking your ego out of it, but that's only, we can only do that now that we've learned to talk before that 15 years of whatever you want, honey, whatever you want, dude. And then I just resent her the whole time we're there, or I was not going to say anything. John wants to do this and we'll just go do it. And then she's resenting me the whole time. It just makes it hard, man. You know, you have a, uh, you have one teenage boy, one teenager, I'm a 14 year old, an eight year old, an eight year old. What, what about smartphones and the role that they're playing? Because I just saw, uh, I think it was Jonathan Haidt just came out with a book. Yeah, dude. Sort of stuff that's, what a masterpiece. I've seen, have you read it? Uh, I've got it sitting right on my bed. Okay, so I've seen, I've, I've read about it. I haven't read it, but I've read about it and I've seen some interviews and he, he I think he's advocating for like kids not to have them for till like 16 or something like that because of the the data. Like how how do you navigate that as a parent? Because like I, like I said, I have four kids, but there's a big age gap. And my older kids were during that. They came around right when smartphones were like a thing. Mm-hmm. And we really didn't know sure. what the hell. So it was like, here you go. Here's your iPad. Oh, cool. Kids are quiet. Now it's like, uh-oh, this is probably not a good idea. Like, like what do you think is good practices for families around giving your kid a smartphone, navigating that, boundaries? Well, the whole argument, I think, for me is predicated on this. Um, there was about 10 years ago, and it was an article written, 
and it just said the number one purchasers of iPads was parents of two and three and four year olds. Yeah. And my buddy copy and pasted it and sent it to me. And one of the parents, when they were interviewing, like, what are you doing? Why are you buying this? And she said, I don't, I know it's not good. I don't think it's good, but everyone else has it. And here was her, the final line. I don't want my kid to be the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he texted it to me. He's a rancher out in West Texas. He's, he's a, he's just like you would imagine. He's amazing. And yeah. he said, I have one parenting goal and that is to be the only one. Right. <laughs> and that has guided us, mm -hmm. me and my wife. And so I don't look to my kids for their approval. My job is not to get their approval, not to like, how, how does this make you feel? My job is to make sure my kids are safe and they're growing into amazing contributing men and women. That's my job. Right. And so I would never, I don't know. I can't wrap my head around handing my kid access to the, to the internet on, on a device. It's a madness. And Sean, my buddy, Sean Ryan in, in Nashville, he says, you're not handing your kid the internet, you're handing the internet your kid, right? Mm. Because that stuff's coming this way too, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I just can't wrap my head around doing that. Never offer that to my kid. Um, my 14-year-old, because he's raised by nerds, uh, especially me, and um, he gave us a presentation last year. On why he should get one? Well, here, here's, <laughs> here's, here's what he advocated for. He said, Dad, at least you had a phone on the wall with one of those little spindly co those little you know the swirly cord, yeah. cords where you could call your friends and they could call you and he we live out on some acres out in the woods and he said i got nobody when i leave school i'm cut off from everybody and i actually said that's actually fair that's a fair mm -hmm. miss birthday parties miss get togethers hey yeah. we're all going to the impromptu things that i would have got a call he was cut off from that so that was fair so for christmas this year uh, i asked him to draw him draw me up a contract me and his mom, a contract. He drew it up, grades, you know, chores, all that stuff. I bought myself another phone that stays plugged in, in the main, our main home area. And if it gets unplugged, then it dies. It's mine. So it stays plugged in. My son can text. He can call as long as these things from a central location. It's not going in his room. Mm -hmm. And we took all the internet and stuff off of it. So I want him to be able to communicate socially. That's important. I don't want him to feel untethered. That's on me. I, I missed a, I missed the boat on that, but I'm not going to give him the internet. Yeah. Um, and at what I think, age do you think that's, a, that's a, that you should start thinking about it? I mean, it's in my mind right now, just looking at the data, that is like asking, when is it, when is it smart to start smoking? Wow. Yeah. So it's more like, I, Tell, I, I, tell I us about the data. What is it showing? It, I mean, read Hyatt's book. Yeah. It's melting children. And yeah. and they're so, it feels, and again, I got no proof on this. The the folks coming to say it's still, we still don't know for sure. It's still too premature. Sounds a lot like the sugar arguments from yeah. the 60s, right? When there was a few researchers that were really loud about, uh-uh, uh-uh, look over here, look over here. Yeah. You just can't look at the trend lines, man. You can't hand every kid a phone, have every kid fall off the map psychologically and be like, we don't, we don't know. That correlation is so strong, I'm fine with it. This this is a good conversation. This is also probably true. It's going to trigger a lot of people. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. But it's good to have, though. Um, I'm going to play the devil's advocate on the other side, right, even though I agree with you guys. I, I think that it what matters even more is what that is replacing. That's it. That's it. Because I do believe that if you're doing a lot of the other things that we talked about as a father or a parent and stuff like that, and you know um, that you're interacting with your kid, you're communicating with your kid, they, they feel comfortable must comfortable enough to come to you with their problems and talk to you uh, because you've, you've laid that foundation and you're consistent on a daily basis with things like that, then them inserting those, those dangerous things like social media, phone and stuff like that, less likely to be as damaging if you allow it to become this thing that they plug into and go in their room and disappear uh, and you don't do those things as a father, that's where I think this, what where a lot of this data is coming from and what I think has happened to a lot of parents. And I've watched it firsthand because, you know, as a busy parent who's working a lot or has multiple kids, I get how exhausting it could be to come home and now yes. do more work. Be I a got parent. a digital babysitter, man. And now yes. you have the, and they're happy and content. No and question. so yes. to me, I think, that's probably the most dangerous part of that. Of well, the the hard part about taking away a smartphone, the hard part about taking away, so, like, not having social media in the house, man, I got to put mine down too. And right. I got to get off my laptop. Yeah. And I can't bring a bunch of work home. Yeah. And so I've got to go 
just yesterday, my daughter and I were out in the front yard. I don't fully understand what game we were playing, but it was like I pitched a ball and she hit it and then she ran to she she knew the base paths in her head. I didn't know where we were going and my dog was partic- I didn't know what you're we doing, but I know I was exhausted and I wasn't sitting down on the couch just chilling. Yeah. I have to, I have to miss the next episode. That means I've got a parent. And it, I'll be the first to say I love my kids more than life itself. It's hard and it sucks. And it's every single day and it doesn't stop. And I chose to bring them into this world. And so it's my job to connect with them. That's the other thing is like, you can't just say it's my uh, job. No, no, get on your, no games, no this, no that. And then you dad, avoid. You yeah, the dad goes, it. hits the Netflix yeah. thing. And then it's like, I'm going to parent you and tell you not to do it, but then I'm not going to yeah. engage well, also, with you. Well, to being a united front in that That's right. being a team yeah. uh, with your partner and your spouse, uh, which is not always is straightforward, right? Like it's, you know, it has to be constantly brought up. Like this is this is a, a strict rule. This is something that we're all abiding by. And you know, and I know that that's something that is going to bring friction up. And it's you know, we've had to work through that. Similar to what we found is giving my son you know access to a phone, but it just has not worked out. And so it's like this was an experiment. We told him this was an experiment mm-hmm. to see you know how it's going to affect school, his interactions with his friends, uh, his behavior around us. And it's just had a negative trend. And so we took it away. And then, you know, there's fights and there's presentations and there's all these mm-hmm. things. But, um, and then the, you know, there's occasional slides of like, well, let's give him, you know, some time here and there because he's earned it, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it, it, in terms of it affecting his mind, his behavior, 100%, it affects it. Here's how I know uh, to answer your original yeah. question. And, and I think you're dead on. And I, I think with when parents said absolutes, and also they get dogmatic. Some a few things you got to be super dogmatic about. But I think that flexibility is a great gift to your kids. They're modeling mom and dad aren't concrete pillars. They're human beings. They breathe. I tell my son all the time, the greatest, most wise words a person can say is I've changed my mind. Um, I learned something new. I'd consider that perspective. And so when I change my mind, when I'm like, you know what? You're right, son. I'm modeling for him what a guy who's a thinker and who suggests that reading and learning and changing your beliefs are important. I just, I I model it for him. To answer your question about time and age, here's what I know. This is an N equals one for me. I was the chief student affairs officer at Belmont University, a billion dollar college. I had no social media, never had it, never had it. I had Facebook for like a month in college and then my grandpa sent me a friend request and I was like, I'm out, right? I didn't, I was like, I'm out. I don't know what this is we're doing, but I'm not doing this. Um, Oh, and I had a buddy who was an attorney and I was in court with them once and they were reading a Facebook message. Well, they said, we're going to pull up the private messages. And Uh, I leaned over and I go, they can't get the private messages. And the way he laughed, he goes, there's no private messages. And I was like, (laughs) and we're we're out, right? So I had no social media. And then for this new gig, um, I've got it now. Like it's where my job, a, a chunk of my business works on there. It was a couple years ago after having it for about 18 months, maybe 24 months, I was in my closet, in my room, my closet's in my master bathroom. So I'm behind three doors, my closet door, my bathroom door, my bedroom door. My kids are rah, running around. I hear my wife hollering them, and I'm just like, ah, and I remember scrolling, just sitting there and I started laughing and I, I, I literally all alone by myself went, well done, guys. You got yeah, me. Yeah, like, yeah. y'all beat me. I, yeah. I lost, right? Yeah. I lost. Um, they're better than me. I, I can't. I can't. I have it on a separate phone. I, I, I know they're better than me. They The the neuropsychiatrist that, and the psychologist that worked on the stuff, the tech guys, they're better than me. They beat me. And so I can't in good in good faith say, um, this is 16 is when you should give your kids. I think 16 is when you make lose a fight. Yeah. Or as a parent, or 18 when they go to college, yeah. they may lose a fight. The argument I thought you were going to say that I've heard is you're hurting your kids because they're not going to be prepared for the world they're entering. Yeah. And I remember like this digitally native world. And I remember back in 2012 talking to some guys in the tech world. I was part of a think tank and we were listening to these guys talk. And I brought that up. I want my kid to know how this stuff works. And he said back in 2013, uh, 2012, 2013, Dude, by the time your kid is using this stuff, it will be so irrelevant. Uh, yes, it, well, it was so irrelevant, and it'll be so um, intuitive. 
intuitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it, like this little Don't digital matter. native stuff, it won't matter. Yeah. And as we see AI, like he's like, I was like, oh, that dude called it, man. Yeah. Right. It's, it's the connecting with their friends part that, that was getting yeah. to me, but it's like, you just got to make more effort to get their friends over and get them over to the friend's house. So I posted the other day, I, I needed to do a post. I yeah, have a social cool media house. person and she's always like, got to do a post. Right. So I was, I had a house full of middle schoolers. It was just chaos. Mm-hmm which is one of my favorite things. It's just loud. And they were outside catching rabbits. And then they were playing on, they were all playing outside, but I walk inside and my wife always just has a bowl, a big like fruit bowl that all the kids walk in. They just drop their phones in and they head out to the back. Right. And they head out into the woods and wherever the, whatever doing there, the band was practicing. So they're playing music, chasing critters, whatever they're doing. And I just took a picture of it and posted it and said, this is what this looks like in my house. Like we don't have, I don't want kids running around. By the way, my kid doesn't have a phone to go look up pornography as a 14 year old unfettered throughout the world. I don't want that in his head, but if all his friends are over with their same, it's the same thing. Right. Yeah. And so when you walk into our house, when people come to Deloney house, they know they just drop their phone and they take off. Yeah. So that post went wild in support, but also the negative yeah. was wild. Well, oh, I would never like you steal those kids. phone. Really? You think I'm like, <laughs> no kid, you can't. Like I'm playing defense on this. Dude, if you want to text your mom, text your mom. Or if yeah, you need to yeah. call home, call home. Yeah. I just want a home base. And to what you, to your point, my wife especially, she's just done the line, shared this. She's super good friends with all my friend, my son's friends. Right. All their moms. They'll, text. Call, they'll call her if they really yes. need that, right? <laughs> hey, we yeah. have so-and-so text me real quick and check. Of course. And so it's different than when we grew up. My parents didn't know any of my friends' parents. Like we ran, we ran around all that. It's just a different era. Going yeah. back to the original, I got to learn some new skills. We yeah. got to make friends with our friends, with our it takes work kids' to, friends. It's work. Yeah, to hang out. And my kid takes work to mm-hmm. raise a good man, to raise a yeah. good daughter, raise a good woman. It takes work. It's it's they're they're defensive because uh, they they're doing it the other way, and they kind of know deep down inside, like I'm not doing it right. You know, tell a parent what they're doing isn't the the right thing. It's scary. You're, you're gonna, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna stir up some serious. But emotion. I think, I think parents have to ask themselves: Do you want to have access to your kid so they can text you, or do you feel good that you can text them? Yeah. Is this about your safety psychologically or about their physical safety? Mm, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think now that my son has a phone, I, as I was taking off today, I texted my wife, "Love you." We're taking off. I'm not gonna lie, man. It felt good to be able to text him. Hey, you, yeah. you take care. You take yeah. care of my daughter, right? Like you have a good time, make good choice. It felt good to text her, in, but in, that's about my comfort, not his. I read this article actually. In fact, that and I've been testing this with my older kids, where when you text your kid and they read the text, it doesn't affect them nope. neurochemically the same way as just hearing your voice. That's right. And so uh, we have outsourced all of our relationships to digital, right? Yeah. And um, it you're when you text somebody, you're sending them data. You are not connecting with them. I can text my wife all day long. I love you. I love you. You look so beautiful tonight. I can't believe I get to be married to you. I'm sending her data. Her body does not feel loved and safe. She feels loved and safe when she sees me, right? Mm-hmm. When when my shoulders drop and I walk in the door and I smile at her and I see it, then her body goes, he's home, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And we just outsource all that crap. <laughs> you mentioned uh, pornography, you know, social media pornography, smartphones, right? That's all, that all exploded, right? At the same time mm-hmm. with the introduction of, of, of smart folks. What about the the impact of pornography on this younger generation? I, I just looked up some data the other day and I was shocked at how they find structural differences in brains oh, that are catastrophic. exposed to- catastrophic, yeah. I mean, yeah. we had a social experiment. It's a huge- it's a huge, uh, it's a wild experiment we're playing. My, my thinking through this started years ago when I was, when I realized <laughs> parents weren't sending their kid, letting their kids go to their grandparents' funeral. They didn't want to see that, right? They didn't want them to be in that room. Mm. And yet they're watching <coughs> all these shows with all this violence. And so kids were watching countless acts of violence, seeing death all the time but their body had never felt what it's like to be in a room with someone who died mm-hmm. in grief and more that heaviness in that room. Similarly, now you have a generation of people, we all burned an entire movie just trying to like get our hand over to see if we could hold hands. Right. Yeah. Like think of it like a light switch. That light switch slowly goes up over time. Right. With puberty, with is she can hold my hand. Right. We're going to kiss. Right. And now they miss that whole that whole biochemical, natural, physiological process. It's all just twelve years old 
somebody hears the word 69 and they don't know what I mean, they, not the word, but they, someone's like 69 on the bus. I'd ask somebody in the locker room, what's 69? Yeah. Now they just Google it and right. And yeah. now they're never coming back. So they see a million sex act. And I made that number up. They see countless acts of sex. And by the way, it's in all of our media, all of our TV shows all the time. And they've never held hands. Right. And so you're seeing the record levels of impotence, 18, 25 year olds. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense um, physiologically. Mm. And yet their brains are different, man. You're, you, we've just, I mean, we've transformed a generation of person like do that. You, do you deal with a lot of, of marriages where that's a problem in, within a marriage too? I know we're talking about kids right now and what that does to their, their brain. Yeah. How often do you get questions about that with like uh, husbands or wives that are potentially addicted to it? I or, mean, a lot. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, on the show, I get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, and it ranges, right? It ranges from um, somebody who is... I mean, it's relative. I've had somebody call my show and say like, I'm watching porn and masturbating 15 times a day, 20 times a day. Um, and I know that sounds like a normal, just <laughs> day, but like, a normal Saturday, <laughs> just, <laughs> but like slow day, um, but like I'm late <laughs> for work. Right. I'm, I'm struggling. Right. And then somebody else who looked at pornography four years ago and they can't get those pictures out of their head and they can't sleep and they think that they've, you know mm -hmm. I mean? So it, it's, it's a range. Wow. Right. Um, I'm just struggling to find if you're able to communicate and if you're able to be honest about, I am feeling um, less life in this relationship. What can you and I do to, to pour some gas back on that tiny little fire that's burning, right? That's a scary, hard, vulnerable conversation. It's so much easier just to go over here and turn the computer on and let that be whatever you want and get that fire. It's a fake fire, but get, get that heat from over here and then go back and you're that, that fire in your house just slowly goes out, man. And so I, my challenge to people is yes, it's easy. It's easy. Let's just watch it together and let's figure out some, you can. My challenge to you is what about us? Yeah. We don't need a third party or fourth party or fifth party. Um, or if it's the stuff, Justin watches like 14 other parties. In it, right? <laughs> I don't know why I'm clowning on you, dude. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, like, like, the greatest guy here. You know me so well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like, really weird um, what does it look like to sit down and say, like there's something at the root of it, right? Yeah. There's something at the root, which is the same as that. It's that lifeless. It's SF Perel talks about most people cheat, not because they're not in love with this person, but because somebody else made them feel a little more alive. Yeah. That's what pornography is. You have more like, I really, uh, my biggest takeaway this entire conversation is the the picture conversation before. That's such an easy thing I can implement mm -hmm. right away. Like we're getting ready to go off to the family thing. We're going on a vacation. It's a whatever. It's a Tuesday morning. Yeah. yeah. And one of our kids got a dentist appointment. Hey, what's your picture for? Yes. This like I, I love I that. I thought you were going to take him. I thought you were going to take. Oh, now we're such a, such an yeah. easy thing to implement. What are other things like? Do you have anything else like that where you think like, man, this is a, I, I'll use another example that changed my life too, was the, uh, we were listening to uh, Jordan Peterson on, I think it was Rogan. And he made the comment about how, we uh, make these plans to go on vacation a year in advance and we spend hours and hours and hours preparing for this this you know three day vacation that we're going to do one time in our life and it's like a, a fraction of all the time and he goes and then he compared to you walk in the door to greet your wife and kid every single day you know for 15 30 minutes and yet you spent no time preparing on how you how you present yourself or how you come to your and like that like just just by simply stopping in my driveway, regathering myself, disconnecting from work and going like, how am I going to approach? Like that's game changer. Can you think of like small practices like that, that go such a long way in a marriage that you you've given people as far as advice to help them out? Yeah, that one, um, I'm a person of faith. And so I, I, on my good days, I don't do it every time, but on my good days, pulling into the driveway and whispering a quick prayer. I don't know what her day has been. And I don't know what those kids day has been. I'm no longer at work. I'm at home. Here we go. Right. Mm. And it's the, it's the third half of your day, right? You got the first half and then the second half of work. And then you got a third half right at nighttime and <clears throat> they're worth that. But I think it's a practice that transitions. Some people need to go to the gym, some go to the coffee shop and write, whatever that is. The word that I keep coming back to is intentional. Stop doing work and do dad. Yeah. Stop doing work. Stop doing dad. Do husband wife be there i think you actually gave a tip that i i actually stole this i think from you uh i changed my outfit too so i walk in oh, from home yeah. and I, mr rogers 
Oh, is it really? <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't you who said this. I'll I thought you said it during the pandemic, so, right? So, people well, during, during the pandemic, I told I told yes. people when they were having to homeschool, yes. and be mom, yeah. and be what, change like, your outfit, change your outfit. Like, have a hat. So I do that for like. So I'll, mm-hmm. what I'm wearing right now, yep. when I get home in a few hours, I will literally instantly after I do the thing in the driveway, then I go right upstairs mm-hmm. after I greet my son and I put like sweats and yep. Yep. Cut on sw- shorts. I'm dead. I'm dead. Yeah, yeah. It's like it helps that process like not only the stopping but then the, the changing of clothes it's like i'm no longer look like i even look like that's, that's exactly right the other one um i got from Brene brown which i think it's it's the other game changer the the what's your picture of us look like and the second thing if i had to put on there um i read about it she said this is a practice with her and her husband and i kind of rolled my eyes and my wife happened to be walking through and i asked her about it my wife is a stoic, right? She gives Ryan Holiday a run for his money. She is a stoic. <laughs> and she just started, like tears came down her eyes when I asked her about this. And it has transformed our, our marriage. When you have the inevitable conflict, it's easy to say, you to start with, you just, you just get all pissed off. You get all triggered. You didn't even dress up for this. Like it's easy. And when you do that, it starts a cascade of fight or flight. I have to defend myself when somebody comes at you. And so the words we use in my house, and again, this is directly from Dr. Brown, is the story I'm choosing to make up is fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And where she got that from is her, I guess her husband's um, mother had lived with them for a while or visited for a long time. And then she said he was, it was late at night. He was looking in the fridge and the light of the fridge was on him. And she said, hey, don't forget my mom's coming tomorrow. And he shut the door real hard and he goes, are you freaking serious? That's tomorrow. And she said she went to Insta Rage. And it just immediately, are you freaking kidding me? Like your mom's been with us for, in my, and he waited for the storm to pass. And he said, your mom's one of my favorite people in the world. And I've got that stupid dinner tomorrow night. Is there any way? And so he was saying, are you freaking kidding me? Because he wanted to be with her. Mm. And yet that's all the exhaustion and whatever was Mm. going on in her life started this story machine. And so when I find myself getting upset or I feel, I start creating stories about my wife did what she just did. Yeah. Oh, you just did that because you. Here's the story I'm making. The story up. I'm choosing to make up is you made that dinner because you just wanted to poke at me because you know it's not my favorite dinner. I, I like that. I, I learned something in therapy a long time ago. Uh, a therapist once said to me, uh, you know, you're, the inevitable is going to happen. You're going to fight. So go ahead. Do it. Just do this one thing for me. You can't say you. Yep. That's, I love it. Go Perfect. for it. Perfect. Go for it. Just, you, you cannot use that word. Mm-hmm. And it was like, damn, that's harder than you think it's it real is. Hard. It Especially is. in the moment. It has to be I. It has to be I. Yes. It has to be I. I feel this way. I feel, or I, I want, yeah. I need. Yes. It's like so wild to take that mm-hmm. one thing and just say, okay, I'm not going to change anything else. I'm just going to say, I can't say you. Mm-hmm. And I'm angry and I'm coming. And it's like, oh, the first thing you want to do is like, you did this. You. It's like, now just have that argument without you. That's right. And the yeah. third one is, I think, changing the environment. I always... Mm. probably the most common thing I'll say on my show all, all the time, all the time, all the time is go to breakfast. Cause I think going to dinner, you kind of cap it and things can get kind of heavy and they turn the lights down low. There's something about going to breakfast together and it's sunny out. There's light and mm. it takes all the emotion away from it. There's mm. no, there's, there's no music that's going to swell in the middle of the morning. Right. And it's just saying we're at, we're off site. So when you go to a hotel, the vibe is different than at home. Totally. When you're at home, your body knows got to do this, got to mow, got to mm-hmm. do when you're at a restaurant, and you're out. Yes, things get heated, so you have to act like adults. It's kind of forcing some boundaries on that conversation. Um, but it's like, hey, start with I. Like, I'm not feeling. I'm not feeling great about this marriage. Not. You never want to have sex anymore. Well, nah. <sighs> she has to fight you, right? Right. And yeah. so, I feel like um, I don't feel loved right now. I'm feeling lonely. Yeah. Ooh, that's scary to say. Well, that was the the reason for the advice was that you, when you say you to someone, it's our natural instinct to <laughs> immediately, <laughs> defend. Wall that's right. immediately wall up. You immediately wall, immediately defend because you're attacking right away versus if you just take that out, it forces them to kind of have By the to. way, you mentioned this earlier in your business. Yeah. An employee does something. When you come out, you screwed this up. Now they got to fight you or more likely they're going to turtle up and hide. There's no learning. There's no teaching. There's just surviving. If, um, if I mess something up, my bot Dave will say, um, man, I don't think I told you right. Here's like how this has to be. Right. I don't, I didn't, I clearly didn't communicate this. That's hundred percent my bad, right? That's a different way to enter into it. Now I'm like, man, sorry. I messed that. Right. It, it in, instantly humbles it. And I want to learn. So I, that doesn't happen again. There's a, um, there's a practice that I used to do in, in business with my employees like that, that I think also translates to this. Um, I've actually never thought about using this exercise with my wife. 
but uh, I'd love to hear your opinion on it is, so we, I used to get these value cards and there I'd, I'd put like 50 of the most popular values that people could have. Then mm-hmm. I make my staff, the person I'm working with, narrow it down to their, their top five values. Mm. Then I say, now narrow it down to their three, three most important values. Then what I did was I took that and I put it, I, I paired it with all of the, so I had, you know, John's top three values, you know, family, you know, success, growth or something like that, whatever the, your three were. And anytime I had to come to you, like definitely if I had to coach up or you fucked up or like mm-hmm. that, I never led with that. I led with asking you about your three values first. Ooh, yeah. And okay. so I could see that being a powerful tool too. If like you know your wife really well or your husband, and these are the things are his three really important things. Mm-hmm. Before I give him shit because he didn't do the dishes or he forgot to take the trash out yeah, or yeah, yeah. because she said this or did this to me, let me ask her first yeah. about her three how things. Because I imagine how many times arguments and things happen just because of emotional stuff that's going on in their day or because one of their values is out of whack. Right. And so then, the, but they're pissed off about the trash when the trash is not that big of a deal, right. but it's really their, their, their values are unaligned at the, well, at the moment. That I, I think what you're getting at is any level of intentionality matters, right? That's the thing that tells me I'm important, right? Yeah. The last time we were here, y'all knew me well enough to know what I like, like one of my hobbies and I have a weird little subsection of the hobbies that I share with Justin. Like that, that level of intentionality was way more important than the gift. It was like, man, dude, right? Every time I walk by, that that has a prominent place in my music where I, awesome. where I live. Um, cool. Every time I walk by, it's a memory of like the level of intentionality and some new guys that hey, I trust and are good people, but like. Dude, those dudes thought about me when I was in the room, right? And if you give that to your spouse, good God, man. Mm. Like, and by the way, it's so easy. It's just right. easy, man. It's just easy. I mean, it's that simple. It's just simple of just asking, you know, mm. that shows that you care. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, an easier one is, uh, how can I love you today? That's that's kind of a, another version of what you picture this. Like, how can I love you today? Yeah. And sometimes my wife will say, don't ask me that question. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just don't do your little babble stuff, psycho babble stuff. And that's fine. But um, sometimes she says, I don't know. Cool. I, I know I put it out there and I asked. Mm, good Get deal. Like that. John, always great having yeah. you on, man. Yeah, yeah. You guys are awesome. Love you, brother. Yeah. Hey, it's good to hear from you this time. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome, man. You call me out. I, I love listening to conversations, no, man. Yeah, that was good. That was so good stuff. We're going to have you back. We're going to have you on again. No, you guys got to come to Nashville. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I, I want to come for this, the holiday. I want to come out there for the Christmas time. That's when I really want to go there. Dude, come out. And we'll we'll make some we'll make some internet. Pieces. I know you've already told us that we could use the studio. That was our only like hesitation we got you to make that screw it up, man. It'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, it's way be... cooler than this. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yes. guys, actually, when, we hang, when we hang these mics up, let's let's get these guys to commit to a date. I'm about it. I would love to do that. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. that'd be yeah. incredible. Thanks. Love you guys. Thank y'all. Yep. Thank you. Awesome.